Well, good morning. It is another rainy day. It is Saturday, September the 28th. And uh, we're going to go straight into the King James Bible, the second book of Samuel. This is chapter 4, and it's not too big. And when Saul's son heard that Abner was dead in Hebron, his hands were feeble, and all the Israelites were troubled. And Saul's son had two men that were captains of bands. The name of one was Rana, the name of the other Rechab, the sons of Remon, the Berethite, of the children of Benjamin, for Berethite also was reckoned to Benjamin. And the Berethites fled to Gataim and were sojourners there until this day. And Jonathan, Saul's son, a son that was lame of his feet, he was five years old when the tidings of Saul and Jonathan out of Jezreel. And his nurse took him up and fled. And it came to pass, as she made haste to flee, that he fell and became lame. And his name was Mephizbosheth. And the sons of Rimon and the Berethite, Rechab and Bana, went and came about the heat of the day to the house of Ishbosheth, who lay on a bed at noon. And they came thither into the midst of the house, as though they would have fetched wheat. And they smote him under the fifth rib. And Rechab and Bana, his brother, escaped. For when they came into the house, he lay on his bed in his bedchamber, and they smote him and slew him and beheaded him and took his head and gat them away through the plain all night. And they brought the head of Ishbosheth unto David at Hebron and said to the king, Behold, the head of Ishbosheth, the son of Saul, thine enemy, which sought thy life. And the Lord hath avenged my Lord, the king this day of Saul and of his seed. And David answered Rechab and Bana, his brother, the sons of Rimon, the Barathite, and said unto them, As the Lord liveth, who hath redeemed my soul out of all adversity. When one told me, saying, Behold, Saul is dead, thinking to have brought good tidings, I took hold of him and slew him in Ziklag. Who thought that I would have given him a reward for his tidings? How much more, when wicked men have slain a righteous person in his own house upon his bed, shall I not therefore require his blood of your hand and take you away from the earth? And David commanded his young men, and they slew them and cut off their hands and feet and hanged them up over the pool in Hebron. But they took the head of Ishbosheth and buried it in the sepulchre of Abner in Hebron. It's kind of like a repeated story, isn't it? Just as David said. They went and slayed a righteous person, someone who was innocent and crippled. It kind of reminds me of the four knights that, um, oh, let me get the names right here. I don't think I can get the right king in England who was talking about Thomas Becket of Canterbury and they said who he said who will rid me of this priest because he wasn't um, towing the line to the king the way he thought he would do they started out as friends and uh, and Thomas Becket had other ideas and uh, he wanted to follow God's plan not the kings. And so these four knights took it upon themselves to ride down to Canterbury from London and they slew Thomas Becket in a very vicious manner in the cathedral. So much so that one of the sword swings actually cut off the top of his head. A brutal, brutal way to die. Um, and he's now honored in the cathedral Thomas of Beckett. Um, it kind of reminds me of that thing, you know, where 
people underneath the king think they're doing the right thing. Um, and they went without the king's permission. And that king, oh, I can't remember his name. I think it was one of the Henrys, um, walked into Canterbury barefoot, wearing effectively sackcloth, and submitted himself to a beating by the monks there as way of, of uh, taking the blame for what had happened because it was his knights. I don't know what happened to them. Uh, there's a lot of history I don't know, but this story kind of reminds me of that, you know, whereby, you know, and, and again, it takes us to, uh, I think it's Proverbs, you know, do not lean on your own understanding. In all things, we should trust God and pray to God. Um, I prayed to God last night and this morning. Um, you know, <laughs> a silly little thing happened. Um, I've got old wire, it's actually chicken wire, around the catio for our barn cats. And uh, it's been fraying around the edges and rusting. And even though it's galvanized, it's been up there a long time. And I've got some powder-coated, really good wire to put up. I just haven't had the time to do it. And the little monkeys, they managed to find a hole, and, and three of them got out. And there were three that were very near and dear to me as well. Not that there, the others aren't, but these three hold a special place in my heart. And uh, I managed to catch one almost immediately last night. And... Uh, than the other two this morning. And I thank God for that because the final one, she was my, <laughs> she's just so precious to me. Her name's Tiny Two. And she has the most beautiful eyes and she's kind of like a um, gray mottled tiger stripe, beautiful little cat, beautiful eyes. Won't let me pet her, but she's so, so curious about me. And in final desperation this morning, I just was doing some stuff outside and she happened to be in a box near the garbage cans that I was putting garbage into. And I kind of ignored her, went back and got some more stuff to throw in the garbage can, the recycling bin. And she jumped down. And I'd been praying to God to help me get her back in. I had the catio door open. The other cats were on the inner room of the catio in the barn. So they were shut in there safe and I'd fixed all the holes. And she just, casually as you like, walked into the barn of her own accord, into the catio. And it was like, thank you, Lord. I went behind her and shut the door. And I almost broke down and cried because it was just, <laughs> just such a special event, you know, that happened like that. And, uh, I think now and again, God uses these cats to, to just prove to me that, you know, his hand is still in my life and he's doing things. And uh, one of the devotionals this morning from uh, In Touch Ministries, which was um, Charles Stanley's ministries, they're publishing a lot of his works. He published, he wrote so much that they're still publishing his original works via emails and devotionals. And it was about the fact that spiritual events do take place in our life and, and why do they? And, you know, one of the final reasons he put up was this, so that God could prove that he's close to you. And I got to say, we had a very trying day yesterday. Trisha's grandson had a car accident. He's okay. He's home. But his truck was written off. He had to be cut out of it. I mean, there can't be a more anxious moment, you know, for a parent or a grandparent 1,500 miles away just waiting to hear what had happened. But he's okay. So yesterday was quite a trial. <laughs> and then the cat's getting out, and uh, there was a little bit of friction with someone else in the morning. And, you know, we got through that. And, and it's just like now and again, you get tested and tried. And in everything, I never lost faith in what God, that God was there with us all. And I knew that I could not be 
tempted or tested beyond my capabilities or beyond what God was going to allow. So I knew that there was going to be a positive outcome. And there was. I had faith in it. And, and there was a positive outcome. And I truly feel that the hand of God does intervene in the lives of men in, in many different ways. And uh, sometimes people call it miracles. Sometimes people call it the grace of God. Sometimes people call it healings, um, miraculous events, whatever. I think sometimes the words um, I, I, I don't think that the English language is used correctly in, in, in a lot of instances. Um, and, there's, and there's an understanding or a misunderstanding of how God works in our lives. Um, you must understand that God upholds his creation with his mighty hand. And if, if God was to, to lower his hand, if he was to say no more, everything would cease to exist. He upholds his creation with his mighty hand. And therefore, being omniscient, omnipresent, he knows where we're going to end up. You know, I've said this before, yes, he knows. We are predestined. But he knows us from before we were in our mother's womb. He told Jeremiah that. And because he lives in the future, this is a concept that we just can't get our heads around. And so therefore, no, he's not sitting up there twiddling his thumbs like Justin Peter says, waiting for a moment to just say, oh, I think I'm going to interfere in his life and that, you know. No, that's, that's not some sort of perception that we should have. I, I, I'm sorry, Justin Peters, I, I, I think you're totally wrong on that. And I love you, man. You're, you're, you're a good, good pastor and you speak up, you, you carry out God's word uh, as a good disciple, um, especially in challenging charismatic preaching and teachings that are taking place and are so prolific in this world. Justin Peters is a good man to follow. This all came out of the fact that when Trump had his ear, you know, damaged by that bullet, um, people were saying it was an act of God, it was a miracle, and he said, no, it's just God upholding the universe with his mighty right hand. To that extent, yes, uh, I agree with him, but that by its very nature is an intervention of God. He does intervene in men's lives. And um, just as Charles Stanley said, he intervenes for different reasons. And, and, and sometimes it is just to prove to you that he's there. It's just to, because there's something coming that he wants you to say, you know, trust me in this because, you know, here's a little sign, trust me in this because I'm, I'm moving you forward or something's going to happen that you're going to need to be really rock solid in your faith in me, you know, whatever. Um, he loves us. Who wouldn't, what parent would not do that? You know, imagine when you were teaching your kid to ride a bike, you know, and you got your hand on the, on the seat at the back, propping them up and they're pedaling and they're, they're saying, dad, don't let me go. Dad, don't let me go. And I say, no, fine. You're, you're going to be good. You're okay. I got you, you know, and then you're kind of like loosely, you know, holding on to it and you realize, hey, he's got his balance. The equilibrium's working right. He's steering straight. He's wobbling. And you, you kind of let go a little bit, don't you? You stay there. You never leave his side, but you kind of let go. And then, you know, in, in a little moment of panic, he says, Dad, you still there? Yeah, I'm right here, you know, and, and, and you steady him again. You know, you're kind of constantly reassuring the kids going through a trial, your son, your daughter, they're going through a little trial, but you're constantly there reassuring them. And I think God does that to us as well. He is a reassuring, loving father. And thank you, Lord. Thank you, Abba, Father, for that. You know, thank you, Abba. 
Um, please don't reduce Abba as an adult to thank you daddy or thank you big daddy. We're adults. Abba is a respectful sign to a loving father, okay? So say Abba. Don't go saying daddy or big daddy or anything like that. It's, um, it's, it cheapens it, you know, reduces it. Don't do that. Thank you, Abba Father. And uh, thank you for listening, watching, partaking in my daily routine as we work our way through the Bible. Look how far we've got. This section we've read already, and, and this is what we've got to go, you know. <laughs> it's incredible. I, I'm just amazed, you know, we're one chapter a day we're reading through the Bible together. It's so wonderful. Thank you, God. Remember, God loves you. I love you too. Have a good day. Don't worry about the rain. It's going to end one day soon. <laughs> Speak to you tomorrow. Bye for now.